Uh, oh, oh, we're, we're live. I'm sorry. Sorry, I was really trying to figure out, you know, like if I was going to have a little extra work done, what I would have done because we're in this theme today of grace while aging. And I would certainly hate to have some grace while aging around my appearance, huh? So I'm very glad to have you here with the last night of uh, our summit, official last night of the summit. We do have a bonus day coming up in two days, but this is the last official uh, uh, panel discussion last day. And glad to have you all here with us. I'm going to introduce us to our speakers today, our panelists tonight. We have with us Allison Rapp. She's been a practitioner, Feldenkrais practitioner and trainer for 35 years. She lives in Northern California and she offers private and group consultations and sessions designed to help holistic practitioners grow themselves and their practices at every stage of the practitioner journey. I think she started this about this part of her life, maybe about 10 years ago. It's hard for me to remember. Is that right, Allison? You can go ahead and unmute yourself now. Sorry, I thought I did. Uh, yes. Yeah, about 10 years ago. Yeah, about 10 years ago. Yeah, so she's, uh, well, we'll hear about that a little bit more after, in a, in a bit. So thanks, Allison, for joining us. And then we have Mary Beth Smith. She's the founder and director of the Feldenkrais Center of Houston. And she has been on the faculty of, uh, for voice, at the School of Music in Texas, at Texas State University. Uh, and she's been teaching at the Young Center for many years, Houston's Young Center Awareness for Movement at Mint for many, many years. And she just has this very eclectic, I'd say, uh, population that she works with from performers to children to people with everyday orthopedic or neurological problems, yeah? That's true. I, I tell people I work with a lot of baby boomers who just want a little help reaching for whatever is up high on the shelf. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, and all three of us have had a bit of a passion for helping practitioners or helping get the word out about the work. So we had that in common. And uh, I'm not sure what age you all are, but I'm 61. If anybody want to say? Oh, is this truth or dare? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 70. Okay. I, I am on the on the verge of 65. I'll be 65 in uh, seven days, one week from well, today. Happy. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're Cynthia's all aware. Our, Cynthia's this our is, young whippersnapper. <laughs> yeah, the young whippersnapper. That's right. We're all aware at this stage of uh, the. Uh, we're all aware of the process of aging, aren't we? We're, of what we call aging. Of course, we had these four great uh, speakers in this track, and I'm just gonna quickly run those down for people so they can hear about who they are. We had Annette Banyel talking about what can we expect as we age. We had Russell and Linda Delman talking about their understanding of how a couple grows, ages together, and, and that process of grace as that happens. We had Frederick Shang talking about working with elderly or, I don't know if elderly is really the right word that he used, but senior population, I think is what he said. I think he called it the senior, the senior population. And then we had Nancy Haller discussing an issue that's uh, near and dear to lots of people's hearts at a lot of different ages, but certainly for people who identify themselves as in the last third of their life and its memory memory. So memory and brain fog and the ability to comprehend. So we, if you haven't watched those, we certainly recommend that you watch them. But um, here we are trying to figure out how we want to navigate together for the next uh, hour or so. We'll take questions and answers from you in a little bit, but let's get started. And I think I actually want to start with uh, a knot, uh, a little bit of a knot, and just let's take off from there. And there was a couple of things that she said that we, uh, I think we all found compelling. And one was just this idea that you don't say a child is aging, even though a child is aging. Like, what is this point? I, I think it's a really interesting thing, because one way of looking at this is you come in to the world and you go out of the world and you don't leave the person that you came, right? And <clears throat> somehow you have to get from who you were to who you are at the end. And that is the process of aging. And we tend to think that aging only happens like at a certain time. When I was a kid, aging started at 50. And now, you know, when I was 50, everybody was laughing at that idea. Now I'm 70 and I'm like, I don't know. 
doesn't feel like aging to me. So I think a lot of it has to do with what we look at other people doing, mm -hmm. right? Not at what we look at ourselves doing and say, oh yeah, I'm getting older. I mean, I, I am. No, I, 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 I am. Yeah. But you know, it's not like I'm, I feel like I'm feeble. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I think it's relative, isn't it? You know, I mean, we, I think one reason why we don't say that a baby is aging is because we're a lot older than the baby. But I remember when my grandson, who's now six, was about two, and a four-year-old would come in the room and my daughter would say, wow, he's a big kid. You know, so we, we are drawing attention to sort of where people are, I think, from the beginning, which is that acknowledgement of maybe more experience or longevity or whatever. And then about, about midlife, you know, you, you start to have a little relativity shifts and then shifts again. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating to me how we have decided that uh, most of the physical changes up to around age 30, we see as very positive, like, um, but then there's something that happens from mid thirties on that we start identifying the physical changes that we have as negative. And um, I, I just wonder if, if that's pervasive in every kind of culture. I, I suspect it's not in some uh, cultures, which are more I, community. I think it's even more pervasive in certain ways because I can remember, I don't know how many, this is a function of aging. I don't remember how many decades ago it was that I had a client who came to me in her 20s and said, I know I'm already past my peak. And I, was, I, I mean, that was that. And there was, I mean, it wasn't that she was neurologically impaired in any way. She was basically a normal person who had some pain, right? And past her peak. And so I think that there is, I think a lot of times it comes from how we grew up, what our expectations were when we were younger what we saw happening around us. You know, I mean, I, I saw, I, I grew up actually in a restaurant and I worked in the check room, the coat check room um, during high school. And what that entailed was taking people's coats and then doing my homework for two hours while they did their thing and then giving them their coats back, right? And we had a group that met that was called the Golden Agers. And you had to be 50 to get into that group. And I remember looking at those people as a teenager thinking, oh my God, they're almost dead. Right, and they a lot of them appeared almost dead because we told people that they should be almost dead at that age. And if you if you decide you're going to comply, you just get dead at fifty. Yeah, I mean, I do think a lot of it has to do with how we keep we keep moving and calling ourselves to awareness. That's what I notice in a lot of people. What do you think, Mary Beth? The the quotation from Moshe Feldenkrais that kept coming to me through all of these talks was we act in accordance with our self-image. And uh, that has been so, uh, such a guiding light for me in the work. One of the things I first noticed when I entered my practitioner training, uh, my, my oldest living relative was still alive then, my Aunt Bess. Uh, she was the last of the Mohicans. She lived to be 106 years old. Wow. And she really had all of her marbles until about the last two years. And she maintained an intense interest in everybody and everything around her. She, she had been a pastor's wife, so she was used to, you know, sending cards to people. And this really provided a lot of structure for her life. And I remember thinking in my Feldenkrais class uh, training, you know, I, I potentially have the genes to, uh, to be sticking around here for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I had this moment of awareness where I thought, I would love to be just really old, but I don't want to feel old. And I saw pretty clearly that this Feldenkrais work was going to be my, my ticket to, uh, to opening up those possibilities for myself. Yeah, that's, you know, that's definitely what I hope, Mary Beth. I see, I, I had very lively grandparents. But they were, uh, as particularly on one side, the physically, you know, pretty challenged from extremely hard working farm lives at, mm -hmm. at, a, at a minimum. Um, 
and I think that they they did try to desire to continue to grow their mind to some degree. But I did also see the constraints of what they thought of themselves as in terms of aging. So my one grandmother really always loved the color purple, and she never allowed quite allowed herself to wear it. And when that book, the poem came out, <laughs> that was such an odd idea to her. And she made me a bedspread with this big bright color purple bedspread, but she couldn't allow herself right to to engage in that. And I thought about, I thought about her when I was deciding to wear my bright pink tonight, you know, this is like, uh, this is something that she would be so thrilled that I would be gutsy enough to wear it, but it wouldn't have been her thing, right? To her, it would have been like, really, like, wildly, uh, wildly, uh, whatever, for me to do that, for her to do that. Uh, Well, for her to do that, I think this is an interesting thing, because I feel a lot like things are okay for other people, but not for me. Mm -hmm. And some of it, it's like, well, it's really true. I mean, if I look at myself wearing those, those long, skinny dresses and those, I mean, it's it's like, it's really the wrong look for me. I'm five feet three, you know, I'm not tall enough to carry the look. But I think one of the things that we do is we take our sense of how we look in the mirror into everything. And then a lot of things become off limits. And I think this was for me one of the things I was in my I was 25 when I started my training with Moshe and I was listening to this was another senior moment if I told you that I've been a practitioner for 35 years that's I don't know where I got that I've been a practitioner for 45 years so (laughs) more than 35 years more than 35 that's right more than 35 more (laughs) many more but when I lay down on the floor that first day with Moshe in 1975 I was 25 years old and I discovered why I had been unable to feel comfortable in a gym class for my entire life. Why I almost didn't graduate from high school because the quarter of a credit that we needed to accumulate every year in senior year was about gymnastics. And the person who was teaching it knew how to do it and how to show it the same way a thousand times, but couldn't teach it, couldn't help me understand how to learn it or how to become the person who could do it which i think is actually that i think is what we're really talking about is how do you become the person who has the full potential open in your life who wears bright pink or admits to being 70 or has whatever situation you have in your life and you own it you embrace it and you say you know what this is part of my purpose you allow yourself to do something, even if you're not good at it, quotes, good at it. I mean, this is the big challenge of our culture, it seems like, is that we allow ourselves to box ourselves in, and then we, we are constrained by that, both literally physically, as well as, as emotionally and mentally. I couldn't agree more, you know, coming out of a fine arts background and, you know, having sort of the pursuit of excellence drilled into me from a very, uh, very early age. Ooh, there's a cat about to make an appearance. I like that tail. It's not every, everyone. I'll just throw my tail off here. Everyone, please we don't check your Zoom bingo card now for the appearance of an animal <laughs> during, the, during the call. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> Truth. We were talking about truth in fine arts. <laughs> yes, uh, excellence being drilled into you. I know what it was now. And it was such a liberating idea the first time I heard it, and I just laughed. But it, was, it speaks exactly to what we we're talking about, which is anything worth doing is worth doing badly. <laughs> and I just love that it was such a liberation for me, uh, mm-hmm. again, on the floor in Feldenkrais and noticing how much I felt the need to be perfect at this and look around and am I doing this right and my understanding and, you know, uh, letting, letting all of that go and, and just that none of the the time for performance and excellence might be later, but the learning process and the discovery practice, you know, we get a lot of practice failing in the Feldenkrais method. We have a lot of practice coming up against those constraints and those obstacles and and we we live through them you know we we learn that we can we can come up against an obstacle and maybe just take a break and wait a few moments and take another approach and it'll all be fine 
Uh, we heard Frederick talking about that, did, exactly. didn't we? When he was talking about the body image of the LBGTQ community, mm -hmm. he was saying, you know, they they have often had a problematic body image and then they come to a class and they come up against something really hard and then eventually they succeed. And, you know, and that's an incredible moment. Do you know, I have to say that I think that some of this, I, I don't know how true it is universally, but there's, I think there comes to be a time in life where you just basically say, you know what, it's now or never. If I don't be the person I came here to be now, if I don't get on that path, when am I going to do it? Because looking back for me at my own training, I was 25 when we started and I didn't take a whole lot of risks physically. I mean, we had a room where at that time, Moshe Feldenkrais was on a tethered microphone and he could walk in an arc and still be connected to the recording device. And I positioned myself well out of that arc. And also well, out, not, not out of that arc over there where he could see me from his chair, but on the same wall, like he'd have to really work at it to find me. And it was too, I mean, I could do it. I could lie on the floor and do it, but I had a lot to get past in myself in order to have it be okay for him to see me. And the first time I lay in a place where he could see me, he like as soon as he started the lesson, he tore me to shreds. <laughs> it was great. Well, I mean, it was like I was doing it all wrong. I was, you know, however, like he was just being Moshe, but he knew that I put myself there because I was finally ready to hear it. Oh. Right. And I, it was great. I mean, it was, I, and I expected it and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't destroy me the way I, the way I imagined it would destroy me when I was 25. And that's what I'm saying about, I think that at a certain point as you get, as I got older, <clears throat> what happened for me was that I realized that I did not, the fact that I had been somebody didn't mean that I had to be that person for the rest of my life, right? I could change and it would be okay. And if I decided that I wanted to let go of something that came up in the process of a lesson, I could let go of it and I could find another way and it could look like I failed, but I knew what I was really doing. And I think that's one of, to me, one of the real blessings of the Feldenkrais method, that it gives us so many opportunities to encounter possibilities, to make the decision that we're going to do something differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, we, one of the things that aging gives us is a constraint. We begin to realize after a certain point that there's only so many years we're likely to live. And that does provide, uh, I think, a mom some moments for us to, to, to go. What is it I want to do with the rest of my precious years, however many they might be, whether it's, you know, five or 20 or 30, you start to realize you, you have a limited time, that there's a, it's just that there's a point in which it becomes more obvious and that, that surely as a constraint, it offers us something, huh, Mary Beth? Well, you know, as, as you were saying that, I was thinking to a conversation I had this morning with, with a friend who had called to wish me happy Mother's Day. And um, we'll say to all who nurture in the audience, uh, whether you are a nurturer or have been nurtured, uh, happy Mother's Day. Uh, and, and he was saying, you know, to be, to be elderly and be able to look back across. And I was like, you know, I think it's possible to be an elder without being elderly. And um, it made me think how in, in my life, I've always been kind of more of a grasshopper than an ant. If you remember the Aesop's fable, you know, I was uh, spent a lot of time fiddling around. And so I do, you know, there's, I guess it's a, what's the, what's the term? Kind of a creative tension. Uh, I, I think people can, can get very um, motivated by, by watching the clock run out. Uh, I'm kind of the opposite. I get a little frozen watching the clock run out because I've, I sort of tell myself if I can just be still enough, maybe it'll slow down. So, you know, to Russell and, and um, Linda's presentation, you know, just that I found that felt the Feldenkrais method helps me just be aware in the present moment and play the hand I'm dealt, you know, how, how I'm feeling that day, you know, my shoulder might hurt or my, you know, what my mood might be low or whatever. It's like, okay, here I am today. I can create some changes. I have some choices. 
Yeah, I, I thought that was was delightful in that way. Instead of uh, us making everything, because let's let's face it, it really, thirties and twenties were not easy times. No. They were not easy times. I don't know really why we romanticize a that. Of, as, a lot as, of floundering. A lot of floundering. Lot of floundering. <laughs> because we're older and we forgot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't forget. And I wouldn't want to go back to most of those times. There's a no, part of me that, of course, wants to be a little bit younger because of maybe more energy or more how I might physically look. I mean, I, I admit that I wouldn't mind being a little bit younger in that way, but not in the way of where I would lose what I've gained in terms of how to live this life, right? It's a, it's a process. Cynthia, absolutely. I mean, this is exactly the, the point for me of getting to the place of saying, okay, doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks. This is mine. This is all I get. If I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? Mm -hmm. And do I, you know, like, do I, do I come in and make the ruckus that I came here to make? Do I stir the pot in the way that I'm here to do? Or do I leave as if my being here had no purpose and didn't make anybody think about anything? And I think this is, we've all got a reason for being here. We've all got a purpose and a way of being in the world that is unique and different from everybody else's. And I think this for me is what Feldenkrais was so amazing in terms of discovering. And I think it took me a very long time. I'm a slow learner and it took me a long time to get it, but I feel like the potential that, that it offers in every single lesson to look and do things differently is exactly the piece that we need in order to step into why we're here and make the choice every day to be that person. Don't you think, Allison, too, that just because you, you precisely because you have this clarity of purpose and and driven to make an impact that's very youthifying you know i i feel so young and vital when i hear from um somebody that i taught you know at the university a long time ago and they were just named teacher of the year in their school district or you know like i i had an influence on something that happened downstream Right. And, and uh, that, that being tied to some sense of purpose. I forget who, who was talking about it, maybe Russell, you know, that when, when we're no longer working or when we lose that sense of purpose, folks kind of do flounder again. And so I think finding a sense of purpose as one, as one ages is absolutely essential. You know, he said, I actually, it just, I have some notes in front of me about what he was saying. And one of the things that he said, that's exactly, I think the piece that you were talking about is that if you have not developed something that's larger than yourself as a guiding principle, it's easy to end up contracted and bitter. Yes. And that, that I think is, it's such a huge statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And, a, and a, a, a beacon, both a warning and a beacon for us uh, that, you know, the time to do that is now. It, it because it, it it's not impossible to decide to do it at 80. It's not impossible to decide to do it at 90. But it does get a little bit harder, I think, because uh, everyone else is has seen how you've withdrawn, and so they withdraw from you too. And then you say, no, no, I don't want to be withdrawn anymore, and it's difficult then to get back in. So the way in which we um, leave ourselves interactive in the world and in, in a way that is meaningful to us, I think is, is extremely important and not just wait for others to somehow come to us, wait for our family to come to us, wait for whatever to come to us. I think that could be, it can be a very big mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, that's, that's, mm, that's a real can of worms for me because it's, it opens the door about what our own responsibility is in our own life. And if I think if I live in a way that other people are supposed to always draw me out and always provide the, the, the situation in which I can have an impact, that's, an ex that's a constraint that I'm not willing to live with. So there are constraints that I can't do anything about, like getting older. There are constraints about you know, where I live and that we're in a pandemic right now. There are a lot of things going on that I can't do anything about, but the one about 
how I interact, how I present myself, how I jump in and whether I step up or not, that's all on me. And one of the things that I find really most useful for myself in this regard is that the more I can, the more I can take those, those imposed changes and <clears throat> unwanted situations into myself and accept them and embrace them as if I initiated something myself with them, the more I'm in charge of my own life. Mm -hmm. And that to me is another piece of where what Moshe is teaching I mean, that's exactly what it was about. It was about being it's, in charge. It's of the life. biggest anti-victim work you could right. come up with, right? I mean, so I think what I hear is that some of us uh, maybe aren't, I'll say aren't able, uh, never, never have the right set of circumstances to be able to grow out of that victim orientation where life is happening to us and there's nothing that we can do. And of course, life does happen to us. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of life that just happens to us. And, and, but, but the, the, what the Feldenkrais method does teach is this, uh, this resiliency, this ability to experiment with the circumstances that you do have and to look for, for what else, I mean, what else is there that I have that I can bring to bear in this situation? One of the themes across all the, all the talks, I think, is that idea of your own personal agency, which might be, yes. you know, the other side of the coin of what, what's the opposite of victimhood. Well, you have agency, you have some self-determination. And uh, Russell talked about how we, we have a choice. It's not that we stick our head in the sand and uh, never look at things that are difficult, but that we, we've developed the ability to choose where we put our attention and what it is that we want to grow. And, and as Frederick said, you know, to have, to, to then have a body that's available mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to enjoy and continue to enact that. That was super, super powerful to sort of see that through the four uh, yeah, and you get to be in charge of it. Nobody else, I love that statement. I'm, nobody else is the arbiter of what's right for me. I'm the arbiter of what's right for me. Big. Yeah. Do you know, one of the things that's funny about this to me, I, I remember when I was in high school, you know, you have, we had senior pictures taken and there were some proofs. And you, so you had like five or six to pick from. And on the bus, after everybody got their proofs, one of the girls had her pictures and we looked at them and she had two that were really beautiful and the rest were, mm, and we asked her what she was picking and she told us, she actually liked one of the ones that we liked, but she was picking one that was horrible and nobody liked it. And we asked her why she was picking it. And she said that she lived with her parents and her grandparents and this picture was the one that nobody liked. So there was gonna be nobody mad at her if she picked that picture. And I, I mean, it was the worst reason ever. And that, I think, is the way that a lot of us live our lives. When you say, you know, yes, I'm the arbiter of what is right for me, you have to bring yourself to a place where you can accept that you are that arbiter. Because otherwise, it's very easy to live your life <clears throat> pleasing everybody who's around you and making a mess out of it because nobody's ever really happy. And I think that this is, you know, again coming back to Feldenkrais, this, this idea of agency, this idea of personal power, the idea of being omnipotent in my own universe. This is, this is to me, one of the, I, I remember Moshe talking about how, you know, North, South, East, and West, they're all where they are out in the world. But if you stand facing North and you're looking at it, then east is on your right hand and if you turn yourself around you moved west you moved east you moved west they both everything shifted place in your universe and i think you know this is one of the things that he talks about early on in most series of classes that he ever teaches um, that are recorded where you were looking at you know like you're lying on the floor on your back and he says put your hand over your head and people put their hand here and over your head is here. Because we don't think of, we, we relate ourselves to the world rather than to our own self in the world. And I think that this, this was a big, I mean, almost everybody gets it wrong the first time because we aren't relating to ourselves. 
And I think this for me was at that age, it was, it was absolutely formative for me. Mm. Well, I didn't start until my thirties and it was formative for me. It was just shocking to realize how little I knew about myself it, myself in relationship to myself, much less myself in relationship to the world. Um, I only knew that things weren't working out for me very well. <laughs> that I was clear on. <laughs> but, but, you know, that I didn't, I didn't have a, a realization that how much of it had to do with just learning about myself, actually learning about myself. I, I was really late to the party com compared to y'all. I was uh, I was in my mid mid forties by the time I got to a training. I was I was almost fifty when I uh, when I graduated. But may maybe because I'm I'm also a writer. The what summed it up for me. What we're talking about is I realized that I am the subject of every sentence in my life. Yes, you know. I, I and and I was like, wait a minute. This is about valuing subjective experience. I'm the subject. I, I, can, I can only be the subject in my life. And so that was really interesting uh, cascade of thought experiments after that. It's like, what does that mean to be, to be the subject of, oh my of my life? And you are, the, you are the I in your life. And how do all those streams of subjectivity uh, interact. I think that's that's another level of environment, you know, of how we're always uh, we're not just independent, you know, self self reliant. You know, I don't need anybody. It's not that kind of self reliance we find in the Feldenkrais method because we're always in the relationship with our environment, and that's gravity, that's the ground, that's the other humans that are around that we know or don't know and have to interact with. It's pretty dynamic. It gets big fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, what you're highlighting here is sorting out what's mine to own and do something about an influence. And what are the things that are not really about me? Right. So it's, it's not about having to fix everybody or everything, but it is about taking responsibility for myself. And it's very, it's, it can be very tricky. If you, I think if you arrive in midlife and have learned that what your job is, is to take care of everybody else and don't have any idea what it means to take care of yourself. And I think that's, I think that's, um, that was part of, and I didn't get here in midlife. I got here in my twenties, but it was still for me, I thought I was supposed to do things because it made other people feel good. It made them feel right. Right. It's tricky, but I, I think that we all have these stages that, and they're, they look a little yes. different for each person, but we all have these stages that we have had the chance to navigate. So to me, one of the things that, um, that, and I think Linda and Russell maybe pointed this out fairly well, was that, yes, maybe some things on the physicality are declining, but there's this possibility of continuing to grow my, my agency, my sense of self, the way I think, the creativity, all of those aspects can continue to grow. And I, I, I often think people um, think that they're somehow less than because of the stage that they're at, right? That whatever they, they identify the stage, well, I always have to take care of other people, or I don't feel I can speak up, or I, I, I'm, I'm always talking too much. I never stop talking, uh, or what, whatever the version of it is. And there's nothing wrong with it, except then knowing that, saying that, but if you say it over and over and over again, well, then that's something else, right? If, if we're not doing anything with it, about it, if there's no way to explore it. And I think that there's lots of ways to explore some of these issues, but I do think the Feldenkrais work helps a lot with most of these things. I certainly think that one of the pieces that Feldenkrais does that I don't know what other practice does is offer the opportunity to become aware of things we didn't, not just like, oh, now I'm going to be aware of my breathing. And we all know that we breathe, right? It's just like, now I'm going to pay attention to that. But to become aware of things that we had no idea had anything to do with anything, right? Like that I have 
difficulty or pain or whatever in my shoulder. And I go into have a Feldenkrais lesson and the person works with my feet and something shifts in my shoulder. And how could, so the awareness of ourselves as an integrated being, as a, as a person with parts that work together that I never paid any attention to, never got any instruction, no tutelage. I had driver instruction, but I didn't, to, to drive a car, I never had any instruction about how to use this that I came here with, right? It's like this physical thing. And, and it's so funny to me that we call what we do in school physical education, and it really, it's sports. Let's just, let's just be honest about it. And I, nothing wrong with sports, but it doesn't give us the understanding of ourselves that changes an awful lot. And so I think this is one of the other pieces for me about, about being older, that being able to look back on that and say, well, you know, no wonder I had trouble in high school. No wonder I had trouble in grammar school. Whatever the situation is in my own life, I can look back on it and see that this fills in those gaps. And it gives me an opportunity and a way of addressing them that I didn't have. And that generally isn't available in society, I think. Yeah, I have two little stories that that you, that just uh, came up for me, Allison, as I was listening to you say that, because one of the first realizations that I had around breathing in Feldenkrais lessons, I had a flashback to probably fifth grade or whatever in PE class, and I was the geeky, tall, gangly girl with the glasses who played piano. You know, I was not, not a jock or a cool kid at all and um we were we were running and uh ev i would dread it every year when we had the track aspect of of pe because i would get about 20 steps down the track and would have this huge stitch in my side where i just had to stop and and bend over and it happened year after year after year. And so I was just the person that you wouldn't pick to be on your team because I couldn't run. And I realized probably in the first segment of my Feldenkrais training, I had been holding my breath while I was breathing, while I was running. And no one ever stopped to say, huh, here's this girl that's always getting a stitch in her side. I wonder what she's doing. <laughs> or had put their arm around me and said, honey, breathe in, breathe out while you're running. You know, that would have changed, that would have changed who knows what, you know? So that, that was one, that's one uh, very concrete example for, that, that came up for me. And the other one is, is that you, you realize that everything's connected. You know, you're talking about your foot to your shoulder and that idea starts to expand. And bringing it back to aging, you know, once you start to see that, wow, within myself, everything's connected to everything else. And then how does that carry on into my, my family, my community, the, the world? Uh, you know, I think being able to experience and embody a, an understanding of connectedness is one of the things that contributes to longevity. You know, so many folks who don't have a, a social structure around them as they age don't do as well, you know? So I, I think we have another great gift in the Feldenkrais method with just all those experiences of, of making connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I, also I really appreciated uh, Nancy Haller's presentation on having things that were simple to do. So, you know, Feldenkrais awareness through movement lessons aren't known for being the, the quick things, although we offer these quicker things here in the summit. Most of our lessons are longer and you have to go to a class and then you have to have the ability mentally to focus uh, to a certain degree through an awareness through movement class. A functional integration lesson, uh, the practitioner can really form it around your particular situation. But I uh, think that, you know, there's a lot of people out in the world that have had something that's happened to them um, neurologically or otherwise in which their ability to focus is not there yet and then I thought she started us with these things that people can use to just gradually grow their awareness grow themselves in very small bits throughout the day 
Um, what, how did those things strike you, Mary Beth? When I was listening to her again this morning, I, I remembered a quotation from Moshe, and I, I don't know where it's from. It might even be apocryphal, but some somewhere he said, we're all brain damaged. And Nancy was saying, you know, in, in fact, we've all had some event. But just just the effects of living, you know, our, our brains form because of the activities that we've had and our reactions to the experiences that we've had. Um, and so I think, I think the fact that, you know, pedagogically the Feldenkrais method is so, so beautifully organized that you can just do a tiny, a tiny bit of a lesson and get, you know, make, make a beginning and you can always come back later. You can always come back the next day, you know, so you're really building something. I loved that she said that, you know, start, lower the bar, <laughs> lower your standards, start, start someplace where you can be successful. And then, wow, you can, you can really grow from there. And when you come back as that successful person, you're not the same person. So when you do the lesson, it's always, it's always that upward spiral, yeah. right? Because you're always changing and evolving. You're, you're in a, you, you've created a virtuous cycle with a fantastic feedback loop. You know, the, you, uh, with my clients, I call it real-time reporting. You know, you're having this experience and you get to see immediately if it worked or not, and then you get to try something else and, and you eventually, you'll find something that, that, uh, that solves the little, the little riddle. And it's hugely fun <laughs> to have that do you know, I, I want to say something about Nancy's work, too, because to me, Nancy is an amazing representation of somebody who's had difficulty in her life and used it in a way that only Nancy Heller could do. And I think that's exactly what Moshe was talking about. I mean, I think we, we all do it, but it's so evident with Nancy. She's out there with it. She's not hiding it. She's not trying to cover it up. She's not sugarcoating it. She wrote a book about it. She's, you know, like she's right there and she knows things that help people who have this situation that nobody else knows and she's helping them. And that to me is about, it relates to purpose. It relates to embracing what happens to us which I think, as we're talking about aging, it's like if, if you feel like you haven't done it yet or you don't know why you're here, look and find out because that's the thing. It's like the specialness of your life is exemplified by the specialness of Nancy Heller's life. And, and being able to use what happens to you in order to help other people, to me, there is nothing that is more important. And I think this is really what Moshe was talking about. I, I don't know if this is well known, but in his, the training that I was in with Russell and Anat in the 70s was the first North American training program. And there were no Feldenkrais practitioners at that time. He had assistants with him, but they didn't call themselves Feldenkrais practitioners. And we wanted certificates that said, hey, we're Feldenkrais practitioners. And Moshe said, uh-uh. And we said, what? we need a certificate. He said, no. And we said, Moshe, we want to call ourselves fault. And he said, no, I don't want you to use my name. Go out and do your work. You're here. You learn something. Go take it, use it in your life. Make your life better. Make other people's lives better. You don't need my name to do that. And then we did what anybody would do. We whined and we begged and we pleaded and we rolled around on the floor until, he, you know, like sobbing until he said, all right. And he gave us certificates that said we were Feldenkrais practitioners, but it was not his first thought. His first thought was, go be more of who you are and make it count. I want to take a comment here now, start taking some comments. So Perry says, in my experience, self-reliance is a crucial challenge to our self-concept. What do you think about how this affects our sense of aging? Self-reliance is a crucial challenge to our self-concept. I'll, I'll jump in there. You know, it's, it, it kind of comes in on a continuum, you know, so we've sort of talked about from the side of maybe um, in the culture you grew up in, you were trained to fulfill other people's expectations. 
You're expected to be pleasing and pleasant, um, not a lot of agency, uh, expecting someone to t always be there to take care of you. And there can be a lot of power in that kind of dependency as well as a lot of self-doubt about do I, do I really have what it takes to be, to be independent and be self-reliant. Uh, and I think the Feldenkrais method is a wonderful tool to bring people along in that to, to just sort of have repeated experiences of uh, surviving under uh, small amounts of discomfort, <laughs> having lots and lots of low cost failures and lots and lots of little triumphs that mean absolutely nothing, you know, so detach from this uh, need, needing outside acknowledgement for what, what you have done. I think it's also possible for somebody to come in on the other end who, who have never uh, needed anybody, never wanted anybody, always just rugged, uh, individualistic, um, me first kind of thing. And if, if they were somehow uh, impelled to, to sample the Feldenkrais method, I, I I'm thinking that it would address their nervous system in a complementary way, that yeah. you really, you are part of something else. You're part of something larger. You're part of, you, you have this magnificent organism that interacts with lots of other stuff to make things happen in the world. So um, I, I think that wherever you are as, as aging, you know, we have the stereotype of either the person who's completely uh, dependent and can't do anything for themselves. And then the crotchety old dude on his porch yelling, get off my lawn, you know, <laughs> and that somewhere we can move out of those stereotypes into, you know, a way, a way to live and, and uh, enjoy the experience that we're having. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's, that's what came up for me. <laughs> you know, what comes up for me is, Something that happened during the Amherst training, Moshe went to visit uh, Milton Erickson during that time. And when he came back, he said that he had offered Milton Erickson a private lesson. And Erickson told him that he appreciated the offer, but that he didn't, he didn't want to accept it because he understood who he had to be in himself in order to show up for his clients. And he organized his day in a particular way to make that happen. And while he intellectually could believe that Moshe would help him, he didn't have it as an experience and he couldn't afford to take the chance that something different would happen. And Moshe came back to class and he talked about that. And when he got all finished, he said, I think he might be smarter than I am. Well, Erickson had a number of significant limitations. Yes. So he had found a way to organize his life to work despite how many different things did not work for him right. in, his, in his neurology and right. his physical being. It's, it, that's an interesting story, Allison. I and I think, you know, when I think about self-reliance, that's what I think about. I think about a person like Milton who was able to live the life that he wanted, relying on himself in a way that we don't think of as self-reliance. We think self-reliance has to do with the activities of daily life. We think that it has to do with being able to, you know, drive the car and go to the store and get the food and bring it back. And, and what comes up for me about this with Moshe is that he really, he, and he also had no compunction about telling us there are some people who are healthy enough to say, I don't want to do anything to disturb that because I don't know what the outcome will be and I can't take the chance. And that that's, a, it was, he talked about it as a measure of health. And I think that this question of self-reliance is very that's tricky. Truly, excuse me, Allison, that, that was truly self-determining on his right. part. I mean, that's exactly. the point you're making. Exactly. And I think when we talk about self-reliance, we need to be careful to define what we're talking about because so many times what we're talking about is graduating from college, going out into the world, getting a job, earning a living, paying your own expenses. And when you do that, you're self-reliant. And I don't know that that makes, I'm not sure that that's it. Right? I think in Feldenkrais land, we're talking about a very different kind of reliance, some of which has to do with being able to rely on your physical being, 
But a lot of it has to do with what you can do internally when you start to realize that you have options that you didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And that creates a self-reliance on a completely different level. You know, that reminds me of uh, a saying that uh, I think that I think Donna Lilly, who was kind of the mother of Feldenkrais here in Cincinnati, used to say it was something like Feldenkrais can be for everybody, but it's not for everybody. It's something like that. And I, I feel like uh, one of the things I learned watching my mother die when, and trying to get her to try a lot of things that were just not right for her is I finally realized after she was gone, really, uh, that, oh, you know, people know a lot more about what's yes. right for them than yes, they do. you think, <laughs> than yes, I thought anyway. <laughs> and, that, uh, and that I'm not very pushy anymore about much of anything. I mean, occasionally I'm, I'm a little bit more forceful than, than, but not very much anymore. Usually now it's like, okay, well, that's fine. You know, go with what feels right to you if that's working for you. People know a lot about how they're put together. And, um, and I can't really know that. I can't really know that, you know, for somebody else. So don't you find there's, I'm sorry, Allison. I what was a just, blessing because nobody can know it about us either. So nobody right. can actually, you know, I mean, we right. always have that autonomous position of saying, I know myself better than you do. That's right. I, I was just going to say as a, as a Feldenkrais teacher on the, on the best days uh, that, that I have, it's, uh, I'm, I'm in touch with this really kind of fundamental respect for the person who's in front of us, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're coming to us as a client or not, that this is, this is a human and I'm, gonna, I'm going to assume that they know themselves and that they're doing the absolute best they can with what they have to work with. And, you know, we see really the, the, the full potential of the person, but it's not my responsibility to make sure that you fulfill potential that I see, because mm -hmm. it's not about my vowed and unavowed dreams for you that right. we're going to realize. It's about your vowed and unavowed dreams. Yes. And, and I think when, when we can approach people with that fundamental respect of, yes, I'm going to trust you to know what's, what's best for you and how much of this is appropriate. And you don't just have to swallow this hook, line, and sinker. You know, you, we, we always have a choice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Sharon says, there are a lot of societal expectations that we have internalized in a variety of ways about how we perform, uh, I guess, at, at our age. As a child, I always looked much older than I was, which was a terrible burden. Now I look 15 years younger than I am. And people often respond to me in an equally negative way because they compare me themselves to me in a negative way that makes it, it, it because it makes them feel less than in their eyes and all of that is very sad. Yeah, that whole uh, comparative shtick we've got going on, right? That that um, is hard to grow out of. It's really hard to grow out of, and it's um, hurtful to other people, and it's immobilizing to oneself. Uh, well, it is. And, and Sharon, you know, I mean, one of the things that I joke about because it's so serious and so foundational is that uh, it, it just seems to be a fact that women are just not allowed to feel good about themselves. They're not allowed to feel good about their appearance. You know, they're, they're too fat, too thin, too busty, too flat, too hair's too curly, hair's too straight, you know, whatever it is whatever it is, someone will be there to say that you should be someone else or some, something else other than you are. And um, wow, you know, if, if, you, if you want kind of a slow, a slow track uh, experience to, to disagreeing with that construct uh, and, and detaching from its influence on your life, uh, some some Feldenkrais lessons are a really great way to start, you know, getting getting in touch with that, I think. You know, one of the things that Moshe said about people who come for lessons is that they arrive and they say things like, my breathing is no good. I have this difficulty somewhere else. I have, you know, I'm just, I'm a mess. I have this, I have that. And what he said was that it's really important to respect that however bad you may think your breathing is, 
it got you here. <laughs> and it needs to be celebrated because without it, you'd be gone a long time ago. And improvement is always possible, but it's always the case that if you're here working on improvement, you got here somehow, and that needs to be respected and honored. And so when we talk about, you know, women, and God knows what women go through before they get to whatever age they are. I think that there are so many untold stories about what women have dealt with. That it's, I mean, what I am, the place that I'm at right now is, is just simply about accepting that I see a person who's doing the best they can at every moment in their life. And whether that has to do with breathing or walking or dealing with pain or whatever it is that they're doing, it's the best they can do. And if they could do something different, they would do it. And so then the question is, how can I help them to feel like it might be possible to do something that would be easier, simpler, less complicated in, in their internal space to make their life feel more like they want it to be. That's all. And, and if we can do that, I think we've done a lot. And I think that's the, the part where, you know, the, the, the challenge becomes having enough Feldenkrais at that point, you know, because it really does have to be broken down into really bite-sized pieces that a system can take in. Um, if it's too big of a change, it's scary. It's, it's just really scary. And people are not able to navigate, most people are not able to navigate that much change at once. So then we're talking about, you know, the amount of awareness through movement lessons, immersion type trainings, which even if you don't want to be a Feldenkrais practitioner, these immersion trainings um, that allow you to do multiple lessons a day for days on end are dramatic life changers because they're an accumulation of this little bits throughout each day. Uh, and the same thing is true with functional integration. If there's a way to have more consistent lessons in big blocks, I think people are able to do a lot more with it. But of course, it's you know not as easy to do in today's economies uh, financially that way. But you know. I mean, for myself, easy, if I could move, all... move next to a, felt, a couple Feldenkrais practitioners and, you know, really do like a really big concentrated block today, man, I'd do it in a heartbeat because I know it would take me again to some new place that mm -hmm. I didn't know that, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think also we're, we're dealing with nervous systems that are just in the, uh, at, at a point of, I don't know, I want to choose my words carefully here because I know someone will, <laughs> will set off an alarm bell, but I, you know, maybe just opening up, you know, a nervous system that's opening up a little bit to be able to include other possibilities. And um, I think it's important to not, to, to not be ambitious as a practitioner, like I was saying, you know, to not impose uh, an agenda on someone that, oh, I can get you here. Uh, and it's also difficult to kind of rein in a student who is ambitious about getting someplace they imagine they, they should be. And, and so that's, that's, a little, that's a little bit uh, tricky also. But I, I, have the, uh, I, I tell folks sometimes that there are lots of experiences in life when you're standing in front of a fire hose with a champagne glass. Mm -hmm. And it's, ju it's just too much, you know, and your glass is going to hold however much it holds. And you can either get wet or get out of the way right. because all you're going to have is what you ha can use right then. So it, it's and a in front of, relationship. And in front of a fire hose, it's really hard to fill that champagne glass anyway. Well, you break the glass. I mean, or you break the glass. Be a bad I, mean, I think it really, it's, and you know, one of the things I heard recently is that the glass isn't half full or half empty. The glass is connected to an endless stream, mm. right? And I think this is, this is to me what it's about when we talk about aging, that we are connected to an endless stream of our own being. Mm. And we have the opportunity every day to be who we used to be or be who we want to be. And for me, I think, you know, I, I would not be who I am without having been a Feldenkrais practitioner. And so, you know, I do business training, but people say to me, this is Feldenkrais. And it is Feldenkrais because it's not tied to movement. Feldenkrais is what we're doing. It's not the content. 
It's, you know, it's how we're doing it. And I think when you go through life thinking about how you're doing things and you can do th anything that you do from art or music or business or, uh, or reading a book or cooking or taking care of your family or lying on the floor or moving and dancing, it doesn't matter. It can all be done with greater awareness and taking more responsibility for yourself in that moment. Yeah, thank you. Mary says, I like the idea of fundamental respect for a person knowing what is, that, that, that respect of a person that they know what is best for themselves, but I have difficulty when a loved one seems really stuck. Well, sister. Welcome to the world. Yeah, boy, it's rough, isn't it? And the more, the closer the person is to you, the harder it is to be disengaged about it um, because you love them. And also you, you know, when they suffer, you live a little bit with their suffering, right? Or a lot of, with their suffering. So it's a, that's, that's, it's a difficult one. It's absolutely a difficult one. You know, I want to speak to this because I think that for me, a big part of the learning around this has been to understand where the edges of my own being are and my own sphere of influence extends maybe a centimeter past my body. I don't know, maybe a little more, but I can't, I can't change anybody else. I can't do, I can't make anything right for anybody else. I can help another person create conditions that are easier or simpler or better for them if they want it. But this is what you were saying before, Cynthia, that each of us has that autonomy, that we know what's right for us. And nobody can, even if the entire world is telling you that this is the thing that you should be doing, if it doesn't feel right for you, you aren't going to do it anyway. So just- No, you're going you're gonna to self-preserve. I know one of the things that um, uh, my husband, partner, Larry Wells' work in NLP talks a lot about is, you know, putting yourself, asking yourself the question, what has to be true for that reality to, to, to make sense? And so sometimes asking ourselves that question about somebody else, okay, that reality that they live in makes no sense to me. And I feel myself judging it over and over and over again. But sometimes asking myself, what, what has to be true for that reality to be so, so entrenched, so true for them can be one way. But, you know, also I would just say to recognize that we are human and we do live with these people and these people live with us. I, I sometimes think that, you know, part of what Larry and I have as a contract, right, is that we've agreed on the things that we each know the other one isn't going to really address that we think they should address, right? It's not like Larry doesn't think I, there's aren't things that I should address. There's not like there's things I think Larry shouldn't address, but there has been at least up to this point, I think some kind of partnership that, that has become more accepting over time of, um, of, of, of realizing, you know, we each have the right to live our lives and we each and have, have the right to have our suffering that we, that to everybody else maybe seems obvious could be fixed. And then there's sometimes out of nowhere, a moment happens and the world shifts and you realize you could do it differently. And that's really what Feldenkrais work is about. That's really Feldenkrais. That's really what it's about is that you, you believe, you don't even know you believe the thing you believe, but you know nothing else is possible. Somehow this is where you're at. And, and the, the lessons are constructed in such a way that you get a, you get a, a shattering or a, a the, the wall that you thought was immobile suddenly be, begins to move a little bit or something inside you shifts. And, and really it's like a different environment. I remember, I like to tell this story that um, when my second year of training, uh, Anna Wolf uh, is her name now, gave me this incredible lesson with, related to eyes. And I just, uh, you know, throughout the lesson, she kept saying to me, how are you doing? Is it okay? All right, is that too much? Okay, no, you're okay, okay. And then suddenly, you know, it was too much and I started to cry, but I don't even know what it was too much about, right? And she said, oh no, I did too much. Okay, let's, you know, she did some wrapping up sort of integration kinds of things. But then I got up and I went outside and walked in the woods. 
And it was as if my vision, field of vision, had become enormous, right? Enormous. I mean, I could not believe how much of the world was coming into my field of vision. And then I had this uh, moment where I realized that I didn't feel like if that was true, that, that suddenly there was more of the world to see, it meant that maybe none of the reality I had constructed could be relied on. Mm -hmm. And that did scare the mm -hmm. hell out of me. Mm -hmm. Right. So then I had another opportunity to play with that. I had the skills though. She really did not take me too far. I had the skills to play with that, but, but that was because of everything else I had done up to that point that I had the skills to play with. And I can see for some people that would have been truly a too much moment. Right. Do you know, I want to speak to that because I think that it's a thing that is, it's worth addressing how much is too much. And I will tell you that for 45 years, I have never worried that I would hurt somebody by doing too much. Because I think that what's happening when we're doing, especially with private work, when we're working with another person, we've got a communication going with that person's nervous system. And what I really believe is that, that a person who is completely unable to keep other people out of their system probably isn't gonna show up on my table. And that anybody who comes who has a relatively functioning, and I'm not going to qualify it, but it's a functioning nervous system, is able to make the distinction about when it's enough and when it's too much. And that person will hold, will tense, will make it, it will make it impossible for you to go any further. And I'm not going to say don't buy liability insurance if you have a problem cars practitioner, but I'm going to say that in 45 years, I've never had an issue and I've never worried that anybody would not let me know in some way when we were approaching that moment. And I think this is a really, it's an important piece because we all have the ability to defend ourselves. Sometimes totally when true. we choose, we go back to this possibility of letting the defenses down to let some new information in but we don't let in anything that's really gonna harm us, I think most of the time. And I think that this is, this is, it's my, it's my, I might be telling myself a story, but it's worked for me for 45 years. So I think, you know, what I think is that it's not, it's not very easy. It's easy to get to the place of thinking that you should be doing a whole lot more than you're doing because the work is so easy, but it's not, it's not, so easy to take somebody to a place that he doesn't want to go or she doesn't want to go. Cynthia, that's more, more or less true, yeah. Cynthia, I'd like to loop back to um, the, the person's question about want, wanting something for a loved one. And uh, in, in my experience, you know, and this kind of connects back to what Anat was talking about, about uh, one's own curiosity and there, there's something about the Feldenkrais method that sort of ignites this, this life force and this curiosity that we have as babies, you know, to kind of look, look beyond, look, look beyond our field of vision or look beyond our immediate reach. And uh, I found in my experience, you know, I've had a lot of wives bring their husbands, you know, and he needs to do this and he'll, he'll come and he'll lie on the table and we'll have a very pleasant time. And I know that zero learning took place, but possibly I, I, um, I contributed to marital harmony <laughs> because <laughs> he, she'll be off his case because he came. But I, I always tell people, you know, that this isn't a treatment or a pill or a thing that gets done to you. This is something that ultimately it, it wells up out of some drive within. And, uh, you know, if, if there are heel marks down the hall, you know, to drag somebody in, there, there will be almost no effect. Almost no effect. It really, it's really true. Yeah. It's really true. I, I remember, I, I, I kind of Let always wish go. maybe I... <laughs> I always wish kind of, I maybe shouldn't have said this, but I, a couple came in from one of my classes and, you know, people, it was a lot of new people that night. And so the first night of any series, we usually introduce ourselves. And, and when it came to the husband, he said, I came because my wife made me come and I don't want to be here. And I said, yeah, 
you can go sit out in the waiting area if you like. You can lie on the mat and do nothing. You can do whatever you like. And he did that. And, you know, they never came back. And I know it was really a disappointing moment for her, but I was just like, it wasn't the, it wasn't the normal, I'm here because my wife wanted me to try it. It was, it was much more than that, right? It was like, I'm here and I'm not happy about it and I'm not planning, to, you know, it's like, why, why, would, why would you try to make that work? I mean, the attitude is right. not there. It's not, it's not a readiness. You know, I think this speaks to one of the things that I do with clients and it's actually connected to people can get an example of it if they want by taking the gift that I've got. But this is connected to perceptual style in the way that I see things because people have different ways of taking in information and using it in the world. And there are pairings of perceptual styles that have a very difficult time communicating and don't really understand what each other is talking about. And they can have a life together, but it's on the more difficult side where one person, if he's going to come, does feel dragged because the way that it's, it, it's not speaking to him in a way that he can understand. And I think that this is a big piece of, of something that I've grown to have a lot of respect for in the last 10 years that I never understood in quite this way. Um, and, it, and it speaks directly to this question of how you deal with loved ones, even not in the Feldenkrais arena. I think it's like, whether it's about coming to Feldenkrais or about doing anything else to help the person that you love, help is only help if it's perceived as help by the other person, right? And if it isn't, it's a really big problem. And I think that one of the pieces that for me that this goes back to in, in the conversation and way back in my experience with Feldenkrais work is that what this is about is understanding where our own edges are and what I can influence. And if I can't influence you, I'm also not responsible for what happens to you. Because I think that one of the problems that we run into when we're trying so hard to help the person that we love is that we feel responsible. If they, if they are in pain, we feel like we have to fix it. If they're hungry, we have to make dinner. If they're whatever, we have to fix it. And I think that getting to the place of recognizing that people make choices and we're not responsible for the choices that they make. There are consequences to the choices and we're not responsible for the consequences of those choices, right? And so that, I, that, it, it's an important piece, I think, that needs to be stated because it's not, it's not just about whether the person is going to lie down on the floor. It's about what happens to you when you've suggested it and the person doesn't do it and then he's in more pain. And that, I think, is the place where we, ha we have the agency in that place to say, I'm really sorry, not my problem. Mm -hmm. And that that's, that you have to do that if you're going to take care of yourself. Well, and actually, it's it, it's not just taking care of yourself. It it is also giving the responsibility back to somebody that right. was always theirs to begin with. Which means, if you've taken on responsibility for something that's not yours, you're you're actually a partner in limiting their life. Right. And it's it's such tricky business, isn't it? It's, it's very. Tricky business, it's yeah. a very interesting path. I want to actually hear about your gifts. So you have, you each have gifts for the audience. So the, the listeners, these somanots, these learners, Mary Beth, what have you got? I have a um, download video for neck and shoulder pain relief. I don't know about you, but uh, this last few weeks or decades or whatever <laughs> seems like a fixture of 21st century life is people have a lot of a uh, lot of neck and shoulder pain and uh, sitting sitting zooming for endless hours <laughs> do, it doesn't help that so you can um, you can sign up and you'll get an immediate download of this little neck and shoulder exploration and then you'll get a weekly little movement tip from me in your inbox it's a entertaining video that I call the um, movement marvels and you you may not uh, feel like a superhero but you will access some some superpowers for movement. Mary Beth's a delight to read her writings and emails too by the way uh, and how about you Allison? Well I have I have for about 10 years been using an assessment with my clients 
that helps them understand. And oddly enough, Mary Beth and I call it the same thing, their own superpowers, which are the strengths that we were born with. And there are ways of being in the world that we often don't acknowledge because we didn't get any acknowledgement for them when we were children. Because our strengths make life easy. And what most of us learn is that doesn't count. The only thing that counts. <laughs> it has to be hard. It has to be hard. Where was the effort in that? So what, what I'm offering is a, a free a mini assessment that helps you understand what your perceptual style is. And then it's followed on by a webinar that I just recorded last week with uh, the co-developer of the perceptual style assessment. And it's about how, <clears throat> excuse me, how your strengths can help you in times like the ones we're in, in times of challenge, in times of crisis, how you can communicate differently based on understanding something about yourself and what you hear from other people that tells you what's missing in the communication for the other person so that you have a possibility of filling in. So that's, um, nice. that's all there. It takes about- Very nice. So it, it's clearly not inside the Zoom session, but back on no. the page that you used to get here below, there are the links to uh, Allison's and Mary Beth's giveaways. So I want to encourage you to take advantage of that. And I will just say one thing, in the, if you click the link for my thing, it asks you what your modality is, if you have one. And if you're not, um, oh, my giveaway link goes to Lavinia's giveaway. Yeah, Arlene will get it fixed. Okay. Right. Um, so if you're not a practitioner, just put NA in that box. You have to put something or you can't submit the form. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I wanna thank uh, everybody who's been tuning in this entire summit. And I so appreciate, wow, gosh, I, I tell you, I just appreciate so many things this round. The number of people that have really, these panelists, the two of you, all of the speakers, the people who decided to teach Awareness Through Movement lesson inside the Facebook group, Joe Webster and Tiffany Sankari that organized that, then Liz Penny came forward and organized uh, practitioners that step forward, a group of four or five of them that have been leading these daily, twice a day, daily community Zoom sessions. And then uh, all of you that have been sharing in the emails and in the uh, Facebook group, I, I cannot tell you how touched that we all are, that you have been sharing what's going on in your life and how you know, you've either come up against some really difficult roadblocks and what you're looking for or how you're finding the summit to help you or not. I mean, you're allowed to have say it didn't help you too. So whatever you have is fine, but we really, we've really, uh, I've been really touched this round, extremely, extremely touched by it all. And um, yes, you do have a bonus day coming up and you'll get an email that morning with the links for that bonus day as well. I want to remind you about that a little bit because uh, Lavinia Plonka is going to start us out with an awareness through movement lesson at 8 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, which is really early for you guys. So you won't be up, I'm sure. I'm going to have to drive in here a little bit on the early side for me. <laughs> And then, um, but the people in Europe and everywhere also may on the East Coast, 8 a.m. Is, is doable. And then you can watch it for 48 hours afterwards. Then we'll be following on a session on humor. She's gonna help us understand what the role of humor is in the Feldenkrais method. And maybe we started to play with that a little bit more tonight ourselves. And then after that, the afternoon is for clinicians, rehab professionals, practitioners, people who work with others in recovery and movement. Um, Although I would say that there's possibilities, particularly in a couple of them, even for people who are in the psychotherapy or coaching areas to find some things that are interesting. Really the last one in particular, probably. So three more after in the afternoon for that, for that audience. And uh, just thank you so much. Arlene Klein, you're back there somewhere. Do you wanna at least say hello to people? I know you're hiding maybe. <laughs> Sure. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and um, it's been a pleasure getting the whole Feldenkrais community together from around the world. Um, and that's my joy in doing this um, every year. So everybody is um, 
always always seems to enjoy that part of it and and is thankful for that so that's what brings me back every year along with me loving feldenkrais overall um that just making sure that you guys uh, have a strong community and, and keep in contact with those who are by themselves in a small town somewhere but yes it's been a great year and i'm glad to be part of it thank you arlene thanks so much for being my partner in this uh throughout the last three summits and um uh, we're, we're just thrilled with the people who've come forward that are not Feldenkrais practitioners. The summit was not intended to be for Feldenkrais practitioners. It is intended to be for you. You're not an interloper. Some people said today in the group, well, thank you for accepting me, even though I'm not a Feldenkrais practitioner. I'm like, no, that, that's who it's for. It's for you. Whoever you are, it's for you. So I'm glad that you came and you claimed it and you're uh, getting something from it. I'm going to say goodbye now. And... Uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're good. We're good. Thanks. I'll see you on the bonus day. Hey, eh? thank you to do. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you, Allison. Kudos, okay. Cynthia. Be well, everybody.